good morning, everyone. Good evening from Hong Kong. Uh, thank you so much for uh, joining us uh, for this little uh, uh, lovely talk by um, the wonderful Anne Shaftel. And as many of you know, uh, she is an expert and veteran in the conservation of Buddhist art. She's a fellow of the International Institute for Conservation, the American Institute for Conservation, and a member of the Canadian Association of Professional Conservators, ICOM and ICOMOS. Since 1970, Anne has worked extensively in the conservation of Buddhist art with monasteries around the world, Dharma centers, museums, universities, and diverse communities. Uh, her work is referenced by international scholars and has been sought after by many senior Buddhist teachers. She currently teaches at uh, Dalhousie University. So uh, I'd like, first like to thank Anne for um, uh, accepting our invitation to be part, to, to give the sort of um, uh, a detailed and, and very exciting and insightful discussion on the conservation of Buddhist art. As I understand, it's going to be quite uh, media rich and very visually attractive. So without further ado, I'd like to hand straight over to you and so we can have begin our discussion. So please take it away. Thank you for joining us today to discuss this practical and low cost approach of risk assessment in monasteries. I'm welcoming monastics, scholars, conservators, scientists, to those who live in monasteries and nunneries and to those who are interested in risk assessment techniques internationally. We are grateful to the Buddhist teachers who have been advising our treasure caretaker training project since 1970, and to the funders who support our international work, including the Pema Chodron Foundation, Shelley and Donald Rubin Foundation, Kensei Foundation, Shambhala Trust, Kung Kian Charitable Trust, and Thomas Donahue, Rochelle Whitehorn, Henry Ming Shen, Terence Tai, and many others, thank you. This talk today shares 50 years of preservation experience in monasteries, and it combines scientific principles with respect for traditional methods and materials. Risk assessment is crucial for prevention of damage fire, earthquake, water damage, the effects of temperature and relative humidity, pest pollution, light human choices, theft, and the current pandemic, which we added. This practical and low cost approach saves both lives and treasures. When monastics and community members conduct their own risk assessments and create emergency plans for their own monasteries. Responding to this poster, which has been circulated widely, a monk remarked that in this image, we see the undeniable face of impermanence, which is fundamental to a Buddhist understanding of life and death. We would never deny this unimpeachable truth. Nonetheless, we would like to share methods that can forestall the deterioration or destruction of sacred artifacts. Crimes against cultural heritage treasures harm the history of humanity, the knowledge of civilization, and centuries old legacies. Looters and antique hunters target historical relics, leaving behind the wreckage of a nation's heritage. In a race against time, treasure caretaker training teams preservation experts with technologically savvy monks and nuns from Buddhist monasteries. Workshop participants learn to create digital inventories of their own monastery's treasures using their smartphones and tablets for description, imaging, and video. With the dramatic and alarming rise in theft from monasteries and museums by looters and antique hunters, proof of ownership is crucial. Risk assessment and disaster mitigation training 
help each participant to assess risk to the treasures in their own monasteries and to create action plans before disaster strikes. Using their smartphones and tablets, participants learn to conduct and record interviews with elders in their communities. The digital documentation of these living stories ensures the history of monastery treasures will be preserved and shared with future generations. Okay, that's the introduction to our Treasure Caretaker Training nonprofit projects. And yes, as a conservator, I also work with Buddhist collections in museums, for universities, and with Dharma centers internationally. I especially love preservation projects in nunneries and monasteries and look forward to seeing my longtime friends there once again. However, with deep respect for centuries old traditions, this is important. We are nowhere or in any way criticizing traditional usage that may, in a material sense, affect sacred art forms, and especially not within their monastic context. Nor do we advise to erase evidence of respectful historical use. We believe in stabilizing damage with no extreme cleaning or repainting. During the past 50 years, I've always felt really honored to be invited into monasteries and nunneries. This is an image of one of my early preservation of monastery treasures workshop students in Bhutan in 2005. He since has died. We were conducting risk assessment in his monastery and we were in the monastery storage room. Although the monastery treasures were in the storage cabinet, they are still considered sacred and this monk is showing his respect. A concern for many people and on a very personal level and a professional level, every level is what defines something made of atoms and molecules as being sacred. What kind of ceremony or whom can transform it into being sacred? Can something happen during its history that makes it either sacred or that erases its sacred qualities? These questions are addressed in Preservation of Buddhist Treasures resource, and we look forward to your questions and discussion. Every monk or nun has personal experience with risks. And in our workshops, they share examples of fire, water, criminals, human mistakes, etc. We assess risks separately here in these categories. However, in actual real life situations, they're combined. Emergency planning is of prime importance for preservation of monastery treasures. We're dedicated to work with monasteries to help develop their emergency planning and look forward to our next Zoom on this topic. We have didactic materials about risk assessment and emergency planning that have been translated into several languages that we use in our workshops. These are made just for monasteries. Documentation is of prime importance for preservation of monastery treasures. We continually work with monks and nuns on effective, low-tech, low-cost, and confidential documentation techniques. We're looking forward to our next Zoom on documentation. Our in-monastery preservation workshops and projects. Practice documentation, oh, just written with a pad and pencil with wonderful drawings and on the monks and nuns' own tablets and cell phones. We emphasize video interviews of elders because elders hold the history of sacred objects. Field trips in our workshops are so popular. Everyone goes and loves assessing uh, risk assessment, assessing their own documentation skills there because after we have monks and nuns present their findings in front of everyone. We all look forward to post-COVID monastery preservation workshops.
And until then, we're concentrating on these Zooms and the free online preservation resource where you can find risk assessment information and other resources. Our Tonka Preservation chapter is currently at 500 pages and the documentation chapter is next. This resource is written in direct response to questions from monks and nuns and their community members. Let's get started with risk assessment. How a monk, a nun, and community member can assess the causes of da danger, damage, and deterioration within their own monasteries and communities. Usually, each one of these risks takes a whole hour or more, maybe two hours, but we're going to go through them quickly today. Every monk, nun, and community member has a personal story about risks. This is not like a museum or university lecture where a lot of discussion is theoretical. Let's start with earthquake. I personally have been through several earthquakes. Every risk starts with the monastic's own experience of the risk. Some of the comments were, Self-protection, I ran to open ground of the monastery. I brought out beddings, a tarpaulin, and things from the ground floor. We place sacred items in new toilets on tarpaulins and cover them with cloth and tarpaulins to protect them. Small items were covered and put into buckets, etc. This earthquake damaged Lachang was no longer safe and had to be totally demolished. The thing is that an earthquake itself is a primary event. But it doesn't stop there. Earthquakes are followed by aftershocks and often fires. Social upheaval often happens and there's danger for residents and emergency workers. Then follows a lengthy period of daily disruptions due to the lack of housing and services while the rubble is cleared and new structures are built. Some monasteries and chuchins damage in earthquakes may not be rebuilt for some time due to cost and safety reasons. In the past, there was little preparation and planning in order to survive earthquakes. Many people died and many people were destroyed. Many people's treasures were destroyed and monasteries' treasures were destroyed. And we're talking about Buddhist treasures within families as well. Now we endeavor to offer methods and materials that will help you, your monastery, and its treasures, as well as your community, survive the next earthquake because there will be one. Gas tanks may explode. Electrical wiring may cause may spark and causing fires. To put out fires following an earthquake, there can be a considerable amount of water damage to buildings and what they contain. It's complicated. Some monasteries remove paintings and damaged chitins, and others, well, they attempted restoration. Although earthquakes are natural disasters, they are man-made factors. Well, including inadequate infrastructure and preparation, lack of planning and communication, unstable building construction, locating monasteries and communities on terrain that is vulnerable to landslides and more. All these choices increase damage from an earthquake episode. Since they are choices made by people, the choices can be made in a different way for the safety of those living in earthquake regions. Well, even though this monastery was well constructed with concrete, due to its location, it suffered severe earthquake damage. Here's an example of nuns building their own monastery in a traditional pounded earth technique. They believe that traditional structures are stronger during earthquakes than concrete buildings. And in fact, this has been the experience. An earthquake itself creates damage, but after the earthquake, you have damage from so many other elements, fire, water, looting, people steal. So you have the earthquake, lives and treasures are destroyed. You get some complete destruction, breakage, smoke damage, water damage, again, looting. For example, the head geshe of a monastery was located high up on a hill 
trapped in his monastery during the earthquake. He was looking down over the valley and saw houses and monasteries exploding because their gas tanks and electrical wiring caught on fire. He looked down and saw fires exploding. Not only were buildings falling down, but there was fires all over the valley. Fire itself is a real problem, but it's also a problem after an earthquake. It's so important to receive training and protection of each other through certain other trainings available. Monastics are training in emergency techniques to save lives, and we can all adapt these techniques to save monastery treasures. These are important. Enter the monastery only when it's safe, after the earthquakes and, earthquakes and tremors have stopped, then protect monastery treasures, lives first. Know where the most valuable treasures are located in the monastery. Hopefully your pre-disaster documentation will provide comprehensive information, including a map and pictures. Learn how to carry them so they are properly supported so that more damage does not occur. Identify where to carry damaged treasures to a safe place that's secure and keep every broken part of every treasure. Earthquake and tremor damage inside a monastery with shattered glass can be dramatic. Again, with earthquakes, people come first. Statues within traditional shrines can actually move around and fall over on each other during earthquakes and tremors. You can make them more secure with a base and padding that won't even be seen in the case. After earthquakes, when there's little electricity, light is of importance. You can't always depend on your phone for light because after all, the cell towers might be down, you can't recharge. So we like to use these solar lights, which are inexpensive and easily um, provided to monasteries. They cost about $5 each. So important to gather up every single fragment of a wall painting, etc. after the event. And to document. I want to go back to an image that we passed over. This is so important about creating supports and a lot of monastics ask, ask me about this. These are supports that are not even visible uh, in the case and in storage, they're easily made and easy to retrieve your treasures from when you need them for different lunar ceremonies. So on the bottom is styrofoam lined with cotton and both are available in local markets. And the top is Tyvek building material filled with sand. And they both support treasures of all kinds. You can easily make them in monasteries. And I'm looking forward to a workshop about making these props for monasteries both for in the display cases and on shrines, and also, especially on shrines where it, they're not even visible and we can make supports for large statues so they won't fall over, harming people and themselves. It's important to document every single fragment that's been collected. This is documentation in a monastery by a monk of a fragment of their wall painting. In summary, these are some advice about earthquake from Nepal monasteries, the monks and nuns who went through it, and this is their advice for you. Supports can be created to prevent statues from moving. Monastery wall fragments, etc., can be numbered, photographed, and wrapped in cotton cloth and stored. Consider new paintings instead of directly on the wall, new paintings that are on stretched on frames. If plastic is used for wrapping, wrap in cotton first. Oh, um, those heavy Dharma symbols on top of monasteries could fall down. Be very careful. Can make them of lighter materials. Replace uh, heavy glass chandeliers. Creation of bases for statues to limit damage during future seismic activity and lightweight storage boxes. And the best advice from the monks and nuns who went through the earthquake is train yourself in protecting each other. 
Let's go on to fire. Fire often follows earthquakes, but it's a risk in itself. Some of the images that you'll see, the paintings are from old tankas with use with permission. Some are by one of my favorite living tanka masters, Sarin Kelsan. What do monks and nuns say about fire as a risk? They say, fire and light burn the relics. We build a butter lamp house outside. Butter lamps are lit in the lahang only during the pujas and then taken to the lamp house. Incense is only during pujas and then taken to the lamp house. Heaters in the staff quarter caused fires which destroyed valuable tankas. Because electrical wiring short-circuited at night, two lahangs were completely burned and most of their treasures were lost. These are experiences from monks and nuns, experiences with the risk of fire. I wanted to include that because it showed an actual presentation after a risk assessment exercise. Uh, that was a, a member of one of our trainings, and she went to a local temple and she did risk assessment about fire. And she's sharing with you what she found, both positive and negative, about the uh, monastery's prevention and vulnerability to fire. And so, this is, uh, I want to include that. It's Ashwarya Metta. And the thing about it is, it, it, although the sound wasn't strong, it shows what an actual assessment for fire is like. She's showing the positive and negatives. Whether a fire is caused by lightning, earthquakes, a gas leak, someone smoking, butter lamp, storage of flammable substances, or from a person starting the fire on purpose, people can be injured or die. Treasures can be damaged or destroyed as shown in the temple in the image you see now. There's a lot of risk during renovation and construction. During reconstruction work on the interior of this temple, the entire temple was destroyed and everything was lost because aesthetically it was being uh, renovated. However, the old wiring sparked and burnt down the entire temple. Even in Japan, Shuri Castle was destroyed by fire. Fire starts when there's a material to burn, oxygen, and a spark, other source of ignition. It can result from an earthquake or other risk factors. Monastery fires have often started again during reconstruction. Here, some workers were using charcoal to keep warm butter lamps and incense. Well, very traditional worship and also a traditional source of fire. Butter lamp houses are considered safer. However, even inside the butter lamp houses, simple fire safety practices can prevent fires and save lives. Good maintenance of electrical systems and electrical wiring is crucial unsafe, outdated systems and faulty wiring in construction or during daily monastery life can result in burning down the entire monastery or shedra. Many monasteries use, they don't want to use butter lamps, so they're using electrical lamps, but some of these have very cheap wiring and also have been known to start fires. In monasteries, sometimes trash is burned, so please burn it far away and safely. Fires cause extensive, extensive damage. On top, you can see you want to save everything on your flash drive, external hard drive, etc. but they also can be lost in the fire. Water damage occurs when the fire department or other people pour water on the fire, and then objects are broken, looting is common, and uh, fire damaged treasures that suffered, heat, smoke, and water can be further damaged by just being left outside and by handling. It's so important after a fire to know that your treasures 
even if they survive the fire, are even more vulnerable because they suffered through intense heat and dryness and they may be covered with soot and ash. This is a recent fire at a Dharma center in Colorado. The flames engulfed the stupa. There's some new growth there just after a few weeks and all the treasures inside, they got covered with a layer of ash, even though the entrances were taped. Ashes and soot are difficult to remove safely from treasures, especially textiles. Fire extinguishers and smoke detectors are so important. I visited so many monasteries where even in the bedrooms, for example, of nuns, there aren't any smoke detectors. They're so inexpensive. And of course, fire extinguishers have to be kept up to date and people trained in how to use them. From the mouths of monks and nuns, this is what they're sharing with you about fire prevention. They want you to be careful of outdated, loose and open-ended wiring. Be careful of inexpensive, poor quality alloke light, lights on shrines. Plastic covers are suggested for outdoor plug outlets. Move all paint cleaning supplies outside of the storage room. Train yourself in fire safety and response and stall smoke detectors. Be sure that your fire extinguishers are working. Sometimes fighting fires creates more damage. So prevention of fires is the most important activity. Fire, as with other risks, prevention is the best cure. Temperature and relative humidity. This is a film made by a monk in a remote area showing mold on the precious dance masks from his community. Those are the words of spiritual dances and it is all hanging up here. If you see, those are my The mold on those masks not only destroys the masks, but it's so dangerous to the monks who wear them for traditional dances. Although you can't control the weather and thus cannot control temperature in various buildings of your monastery, there's some control about how the temperature affects your treasures. The relationship between temperature and relative humidity is like brother and sister. Temperature and relative humidity depend on each other. When the temperature goes up, the air can hold more water. When it goes down, the air loses its water. Then you can have condensation and water droplets form. It also depends on the type of objects because different objects made of atoms and molecules react differently to temperature and relative humidity. For example, a metal statue will react differently to that made from glass or plastic. Let's review temperature and relative humidity. The thing is that so many monasteries, especially during the rise in humidity in the monsoon, cover their tankas in plastic. But actually, the moist air gets trapped behind the plastic. Then when it gets cold at night, the air could not contain the moisture because cold air cannot contain as much as warm air. And then the, water, the moisture condenses on the painting. This creates a lot of mold. Mold and damage from the monsoon in monasteries is everywhere. And I want to mention, I live in Canada. And the first day of a huge snowstorm, people say, oh, no, it's snowing, as if it never happened every year. I have to get my snow tires on. Where's my winter coat, etc. And it's the same with the monsoon. The thing is that it's as if the monsoon doesn't come every year and you don't have humidity problems every year. There are things you can do to protect your treasures before the monsoon comes. This nunnery has plastic over its paintings all year. It's there to prevent monsoon damage, but actually creates more damage from condensation and mold growth. 
Behind the nuns, you can see that the beautiful wall painting is there. Iconographical features are not even visible. This is very common. People feel they're preventing damage from the monsoon, but actually you're creating a lot of condensation and mold growth. It's not recommended. This frame, Tanka, is the same. A lot of condensation and mold growth inside, not protected from the monsoon. This statue inside a wooden case, same, condensation. On metal, too much moisture can create corrosion. Many Buddhist statues are created from a mixture of metals or alloys. Statues are often made from a copper alloy. It's becoming far more common to have a lot of lead mixed in. Both lead and active corrosion of lead are toxic to people. For wood, bone, and ivory, very dry conditions, low relative humidity, can cause cracking. Extreme and rapid changes are the most dangerous. This is a human bone trumpet set in silver, where the cracks in the fragile bone has reacted to extreme changes in temperature and relative humidity every year. This is a traditional monastery chud drum. It's losing areas of fine painting due to reacting to changes in temperature and relative humidity. And here's very, very toxic mold growing on the back of a framed painting in a monastery. Mold is living. Mold can be very dangerous to humans. Even with this, within monasteries, you're able to track your temperature and relative humidity and light, by the way. For example, at the bottom, a Dharma Center purchased this very old fashioned, low cost temperature and relative humidity meter to know when they should protect their treasures. Mold growth is encouraged by damp walls, leaking roofs and broken pipes, all of which provide the moisture and then dormant spores become active and it's unhealthy for people to be in those rooms. Sometimes in conservation books and Zooms, you see conservators covered up with personal protection and they are vacuuming mold. You have to be so careful with that. Very few people can afford these expensive vacuums and you can damage by vacuuming Again, in summary, monastery treasures are food for the mold. You can prevent damp conditions in your monastery with a good roof, including good drainage of rainwater, repairing crack walls. And again, these are suggestions from the monks and nuns. It may be one temperature and relative humidity outside. However, inside your monastery, the conditions can vary room to room. If possible, fans can be used to in, help um, ensure drier storage rooms during the monsoon. Cabinets for texts can be periodically cleaned and aired out. Spouts are necessary on higher floors to prevent water from flowing down the walls and creating damp walls. Always place treasures on a raised platform, not on the floor. Place treasures in drier places during the monsoon. Air circulation is encouraged. And this is really important. When you see mold, you need to protect yourself, hopefully with a protective mask and gloves. You don't want to breathe it in because it can cause serious lung and skin damage to you. Mold can be fatal. Another risk assessment for water Monk and nun participants who are assessing water damage in their own lives say this, people love the monsoon, but tankas do not. Water and raindrops silently slip through the walls and have been a damaging factor for valuable artifacts. I have been staying at a monastery for 14 years and my room is underground. Due to moisture in my room, my body is sick and my recordings and precious books are damaged. How about a flash flood during monsoon? etc. Causes of water damage in monasteries are spring flood, flash flood, fail dam, burst water mains. 
roof leaks, plumbing leaks, spills, rain causing sheet flooding during monsoons. And these are real pictures I took. Water is dangerous in contact with electrical wires. And these are real pipes outside a monastery um, that were damaged during an earthquake and they're leaking all over. Monastics are quite aware of water damage. I have these wonderful signs. The earthquake cracked so many monasteries rooms. It happened because there was water breakage through the cracks and damages our expensive wooden tiles, walls, statues, cloths, and many more. You have to be extra conscious about water, says this monk. Wall paintings are damaged from water, and often they're the first to alert you that there's water damage to your monastery building. These paintings have been repainted many times. But there's water damage to the building, so therefore they are always repainted because the building isn't being fixed to prevent water damage from the spouts, the roof, etc. Water is coming in through the walls and it's very dangerous near the electrical panels as well. Here's an example of documentation of water damage in one of our risk assessment field trips. Water is especially damaging for tankas. This often happens in old monastery walls when water is deep within the walls, the old stone walls of monasteries. Water. Water is one of the most frequent causes of emergencies, flooding, roof leaks, earthquake damage, burst or leaking plumbing, sewage backup, and from firefighting. What can you do? Maintain your building exterior and plumbing and electrical. Keep informed about risks of flooding. Monitor for water leaks, raise your collections higher, and please prepare your emergency plan. Let's go on to the risk of pests. Monastery experiences with pests are described by participants during the preservation of monastery treasures workshops. Here are some of their examples. And I personally get add to this because I was attacked by a monkey with a brain virus and it was very dangerous. Plus I've been bitten by three rabid dogs during my time in monasteries. Stories from monks and nuns about pests. Monkeys, a thousand monkey stories. They get into the buildings, trash the place. They smash the solar panels. They destroy our stupas. They pull down electrical wires. Also, we have cows and rats causing damage. They eat through electrical wires and internet cables. Lots of rats. Our roof is torn, so rats frequently coming down from the roof. I don't kill them, but I keep a rat catcher. A year ago, here's another. My staff room in the bathroom was eaten by termites, I tried to wipe the termites, brushing them off with kerosene, but then they all came back. Those are exact descriptions by monks and nuns about their experience with pests. Silverfish eating texts, flies passing stool on painting, rats and insects eating our holy books and tankas. It goes on and on. You see, in monasteries, there's absolute profound concern about not causing harm or killing any sentient beings. Insects and rodents live in monasteries and chedras and eat valuable text, etc. Termites can weaken the monastery buildings. But monasteries have different approaches to this concern because it involves killing insects and rats. Either there's killing allowed or no killing allowed. These days, monasteries and museums and archives sometimes approach this by working with the building to prevent pests from entering and to clean often to stop their life cycles. Some people ask about the word pests. They're considered pests when they cause loss and damage, whether it's economic, aesthetic, or cultural damage. They can also cause physical and emotional damage for people. 
the whole idea about pests, pests as a risk is complicated because of, well, do no harm and not killing is really important within monasteries. Another example of pests is flies, and these flies like a congregate on the back of tankas. They love to meet behind a tanka hung on a damp wall. Here they are. Of course, we have carpet beetles, moths, roaches, silverfish, etc. And they go for your most vulnerable monastery collections. Moths can seriously damage your treasures. Again, some monasteries do not want to harm insects and other pests. Cleaning is so important. Termites can actually eat through and damage wall paintings because they're within the monastery building. Other wall paintings that are painted on cloth and glued to the wall are delicious food for pests. Monkeys are everywhere in monasteries. Because monastery buildings are not completely sealed, they come and go. I once visited this traditional monastery and had a meeting with the administrative monks, and they told me their main problem in their lives was monkeys. The entire monastery was concerned. They enter through the windows, through windows that had bars, through open doors, gaps in the roof. They entered private rooms and found food or ripped apart monks' robes and bedding, etc. It went on and on. Monasteries are often not sealed, so birds fly in and out. They live above windows. And therefore, they can damage tankas. They nest within the tankas. This is rat feces outside a monastery storage area. Food, which is used for offerings, was stored inside, that's why. Rats chewed through the bottom section of this historic tanka. I wanna thank pest expert, Louis Sorkin, for all of his information for this chapter. He let me know that it's not only the animal feces that create problems, but the mite and insect parasites of these animals can post a serious health threat to humans. In a lot of monasteries, there's mothballs. Frankly, they're more dangerous to humans' health than they are to the pests they're trying to prevent. In museums and conservation labs, they use anoxia. It'd be very difficult within a monastery. So you want to exclude pests by depriving them of their favorite environments and depriving them of the food that they're attracted to. It's important to pay attention. IPM, which is considered the up-to-date pest management technique is basically cleaning. You're managing the pests by inspection and cleaning. Monitor and clean. After all, the former use of poisons ruins both your treasures and your health. Safe storage is so important for prevention of damage by pests. Moving right along to the next risk, light, light damage. This is an example, I love this. It's an example of a textile tanka where the light sweeps across it every day. Light damage, it happens in monasteries all the time. This tanka in the temple is exposed perhaps to 30,000 lux of light What do the monks and nuns say? They say that they are very concerned about the sun and the light. Light and UV cause fading and flaking. Sun and lights harm our tankas and textiles. Our paintings are fading. A monk was discussing how his monastery used to have old-fashioned incandescent bulbs, but the government came to the monastery and gave them the fluorescent bulbs and tubes saying, now you have to use these to be energy efficient. 
In fact, fluorescent bulbs are the worst for monastery treasures. Light, after all, is, is energy, and it's of various wavelengths. The potential damage is twofold. One is the wavelength, and the other is the intensity. We can see with light in the middle of the spectrum. Low spectrum light is not visible, waste energy. Ultraviolet is not visible and it's not useful and it's the most damaging to your monastery treasures. Again, so many monasteries still have compact fluorescence and fluorescence that were given to them. Damage from fluorescence is everywhere. After all, it's the high frequency like the sun that causes damage to your skin. They can be replaced with LED lights. These tubes are still in monasteries, even though they're so outdated. This is from a museum and the fluorescent tube caused the tanka cover, which is raised on top to completely shred. They've since changed it. Here's a fluorescent tube in a monastery library, which is causing damage to their treasure texts. LED used to be difficult to find, the monks and nuns said, but these are from a local market in Nepal. You can find them everywhere. Please replace your fluorescence. Natural daylight, as beautiful as it is, as it harms your skin, can harm your monastery treasures. This nun is showing us that the textiles outside are fading. Her risk assessment shows a lot of fading doing, due to the bright sun outside her nunnery. Here, these tankas are getting damaged by the sun coming in the window, but also by the fluorescent light above them. Light intensity, again, it's not only the wavelength of the light, but the intensity. It shows how quickly you can have damage. Thank you to Art Ratio for this chart from one day, notice, noticeable fading from one day from bright sunlight. The intensity of the light. This was a famous exhibit of tankas within a monastery and the spotlights, the intensity was so great that people could hardly even see. These are participants in our workshop doing risk assessment on these tankas due to light. Glass does not necessarily protect your treasures from light. What to do? These nuns created very simple and traditional looking cloth covers to their windows to help keep out the light. Window coverings are available. This is in a, a monastery of Tranga Rinpoche and you can see the window coverings there. They're designed to keep out the UV and intensity of the light. You can measure light and it's good to know what's going on. So in summary, we're almost done please replace your fluorescent lights with LEDs. I know they're there in the monasteries. Curtains or sunshades, please. Use inexpensive solar lights and turn off the lights when not needed. Let's go quickly to pollution and air quality. I know people are still entering, so they've missed their earlier risks, and I know they're going to love pollutants. Monastery experiences with pollutants are described by participants here. Incense makes the surface of our lachan dark. Wall paintings are covered with cloth because we want to protect them from pollutants. Butter lamps make things dark. Burning plastic pollutes. There's air pollution. 
pollution from poor quality or incompatible storage or display materials, and pollution caused within the treasure itself as it deteriorates. When we think of pollution, we think of air pollution, industrial, like this. However, even within a monastery, you can have pollution, although I know it's a loaded word. For example, this heavy use of incense during a halasang caused some monks to become quite ill. For example, in Delhi, there are certain times of the year when the car pollution is so bad, people can't breathe. And then certain times of the year during Diwali, in India, for example, the pollution is so bad from the explosive fireworks and other times a year, the farmers are burning their crops. Hazardous air quality, unbelievably hazardous. Again, we're not saying that traditional forms of worship are wrong. We're just suggesting ways to prevent damage uh, from their usage in a traditional way. Perhaps you could just make some slight changes so that your monastery treasures will last longer for future generations. Mothballs create pollution and actually pollution can damage your electronic media. Practical, low-cost suggestions. For example, use caution about placing raw wood against treasures. Even that can transfer acids. Use clean hands when handling treasures. If there's surrounding air pollution, you can isolate certain chosen treasures by storing them in a mini environment. For example, texts are usually in a mini environment to protect them and to show respect. You can make choices in your daily life in a monastery to protect your treasures and yourself against pollution. I know there are impressive international initiatives working towards environmental responsibility. There's also practical and low-cost steps you can take to help reduce threats and damage from the environment and safeguard your monastery and surrounding community from pollution. With deep respect for centuries old traditions, we are nowhere and in no way criticizing traditional usage that may in a material sense affect sacred art forms and especially not within the monastic context. Human choices. We can all laugh about how human choices create damage. But we can't laugh. The weather's there, yeah. Pollution's there. We don't laugh about the sun. But for some reason, we think people make mistakes. It's pretty funny. It's important to have documentation. And the one reason is, for example, besides for helping with theft, is that one possible mistake is if you don't document, future generations may not ever know what treasures you had in your monastery. Failure to interview elders before they die about the history of your treasures is another terrible mistake. Yes, there's intentional damage. Vandalism. There's disrespectful damage. For example, tourists standing on top of a lahang, top of a Buddhist shrine. These tourists were arrested and detained. But then there's respectful damage. Devoted, devoted visitors, for example, touch the bottom of traditional statues every day. Sometimes physical damage to cultural treasures happens from activities of devotion. It's traditional prayer practice of touching shrine in supplication for fulfillment of wishes, for example, like this shows, that is very, very important in your devotional practice and meditation practice and visiting shrines and can cause wear and tear. 
offering money is very important within traditional societies. The nuns were showing me in one nunnery how this new wooden statue keeps breaking because people are putting money in the hand of this Manjushri. The same with these statues. The nuns planned to put a donation box in front of the statues, so that didn't happen. I know one monastic head was horrified that the community was cleaning their shrine vessels with toilet bowl cleaner. He thought it was dangerous and disrespectful, that it was a human mistake. It's also a human mistake to over clean, over restore traditional paintings and artifacts. It's the choice of a monastery to repaint wall paintings and mon money stones. You could say that the mistake is not to document them before they're changed. Another result of the human condition can be political upheaval, which creates situations of deterioration and total destruction, for example, in the Bamiyan Buddhas. Political destruction, we don't want to talk too much about it, but this former palace of home of a lineage head was locked up by police due to political uh, disagreement, and it just, well, fell apart. The roof leaked, and this is what it's like now. Monks and nuns own suggestions to you. Please document where things are so you remember who barred it, who used it. Please document your treasures so you remember where it came from. Please interview elders. Place an offering bowl in front of statues so money gets placed there. Clean your hands when you're touching. Please ensure an attendant is always present when visitors come so they can ask visitors not to touch statues roughly. It's really up to the monastery on this one. We added pandemic as a risk. This hasn't been in traditional list of risks, but it's so important now. Monks and nuns wrote and asked me when the pandemic started, if they can catch COVID by an infected monk or nun touching Katanka and then another person touches it soon after, can they catch COVID that way? And we researched current science. And this is what some key points. Thank you, Irene Karsten of CCI for this information. Following the advice of your monastery and nunnery and your health authorities, wear face masks, hand washing, practical, practicing physical distancing. And also the thing is that many monasteries are in lockdown and closed to tourists and visitors. By closing the gates of the monastery, you go a long way by keeping the, the virus out with lack of interaction with infected people and with surfaces and treasures, there would be reduced need for disinfectants being applied to fragile traditional Buddhist treasures. One monk was saying, our monastery is on lockdown. We've closed the door, except for food delivery. Another said, we're offering food and other provisions to surrounding community members. But we are wearing masks and gloves, but they are not. They are quite concerned about that. There's something about the storage room and isolation. If you go to a shop, and you touch something to try it on, they put it in isolation for a while. So the next person will be safe. And also when things go in storage room, monastery treasures between uses in the lunar cycle, basically they are into isolation. And then they, the virus does not survive them very long. So it's pretty safe, in fact. It's actually very traditional that monasteries have shut down during certain times of the year for practice. And this is also safe for COVID transmission. 
you want to know about transmission? Well, it's actually true that the virus itself is pretty short lasting on many surfaces, but damage can be done to the monastery treasures by using techniques and um, substances that are good for you and for general usage, but not for monastery treasures. For example, hand sanitizer can definitely remain sticky and has substances that smell nice for you and that keep it from dripping down on the floor. And all of those additives are very, very harmful to monastery treasures. If you are actually using wipes like Lysol wipes, please don't use them on your monastery treasures. For example, this is a traditional wooden bowl from Bhutan. It can totally damage your monastery treasures and textiles of all sorts. The Lysol wipes. A lot of sprays that you're using, disinfectants, can cause dyes to run and a lot of staining. Disinfectants, cleaners, hand sanitizers, no matter what they called, have a recommended three-phase application. Apply, leave it in place, and then remove by rinsing. Honestly, spraying things and applying them on monastery treasures is, does not work the same as on your skin or on, well, high touch surfaces like uh, doorknobs. We're very proud of the monks and nuns who are wearing masks, even during their practice. And this is very important. It protects them. And to protect your monastery treasures, be especially careful with hand sanitizer and with spraying disinfectants and bleach and other things around the monastery treasures, which in actual fact may not be able to transmit the virus to you. And also when they're set aside, the virus, if it's on it, will disappear anyway and deactivate. Thank you to our monks and nuns for these suggestions. Our final risk, and thank you for staying with us, is about theft and vandalism. What do the monks and nuns say about it here? I was sleeping in my room. It was almost 3 a.m. I heard the sound. I opened my window and saw a thief was running. I shouted, danger, danger. One of the staff was chasing the thief, but he ran too fast and got away. Another monastic says, a statue was stolen from a stupa outside the monastery. Construction workers stole equipment and building materials. This is really sad. This is um, from Bhutan, youth vandalized temples. They broke these statues to get the blessing substances which are put inside so they could sell them. Preservation of sacred art in a monastery is a balance then between the need for the security of its treasures and the desire to use the treasures. How do theft and sacred treasures go together? Sometimes there's someone local and they feel they need a little money for their family or they have a drug or alcohol problem. And some monastery theft is involved with international crime. The same people who engage in drug and arms trade are organizing international art theft. The situation can be very dangerous for you. It's true for churches all over the world. There are ways like the Red List and Interpol, etc who will help you after a theft in a monastery, but you need to document. You need to have document, documentation to prove that your monastery owns the treasure that was stolen. When you document, you needn't share with anyone until it's necessary. That's why we stress documentation in our workshops. It's so important 
partially to prevent theft, but also after a theft, you can prove it's yours. These go after remote chitins and lachangs. Here, a caretaker was really hurt. He had to go to the hospital when he tried to stop thieves from breaking in. The more remote the temple, the more likely it is the thieves can enter. Theft causes damage to people and treasures. It's increasing theft to temples. A lot of thieves are actually, they're after what's inside the statues because they can easily be sold. It's devastating damage. These are beads, the beads that are worth a lot of money on international markets, as are, believe it or not, horns and tusks. The picture on the right shows some of my favorite preservation workshop participants, and I'm showing it because they're posing in front of these tusks that are very common in traditional monasteries. You have a mandala of protection, just like a painting mandala or a statue mandala. A mandala of protection has the treasure inside surrounded by its storage furniture or its shrine furniture surrounded by the building, surrounded by the site. We call it the mandala of protection. There was a mandala of protection in this nunnery, but the thieves came in through the window Here, and this is a really sad story. This is a, a monastery in Sikkim with a very generous teacher who wanted the people who came and did circumambulation to be blessed by their best statues. So they were left outside there in these small enclosures. And then thieves came one day and stole the monastery's most valuable treasures. There was no documentation, so no chance of getting them back. So now, when people visit the monastery to do circumambulation, other treasures are behind bars. Certain days during the lunar calendar, thousands of pilgrims come in monasteries, and some thieves come as well. Preventing theft in your monasteries. From the words of our monk and nun treasure caretakers, be aware of visitors. Respect the mandala of protection. You can use real or fake CCTV cameras and perhaps have less valuable treasures in vulnerable positions. Documentation is so important. Video interview of elders. Our next Zoom will talk about documentation. Safe storage is so important, and we'll have another Zoom on that. And in conclusion, in terms of paying attention and assessing risks to your own monastery treasures and community treasures, you are the teacher and preservation manager because it's within your own community. That's the important point. Hey, thank you for staying with us for this long but information packed and image packed presentation. And um, perhaps we have time for maybe one or two questions. Thank you so much. And if your question doesn't get through, I'd love to hear from you. Well, thank you so much, Anne, for this, what a fantastic talk on risk assessment. 